Reading today from the lectionary, one of the lectionary readings today was the last chapter, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm reading from um, verse 1 to 11. And while I'm reading that, uh, Ron, if you could just have the PowerPoint ready. Thanks, mate. 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 1 to 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labour pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers and sisters, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep, as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. It's really obvious from there that uh, Paul and the early Christians really were preparing for Jesus to come again. There was a strong sense as you read uh, the letters that in many of his letters, there was that sense that Jesus is coming again soon. And in fact, every generation has had that. You know, more than 2,000 years have passed, but if you look at church history, every generation believed that Jesus' return was intimate. I think that's a good thing. I think that's important. Because if we lose sight of that, then we lose our readiness. It's very clear, isn't it? Paul said he will come like a thief in the night. Totally consistent with what Jesus said. No one knows the day of the hour. Even he didn't know. Only the Father knows. No one knows the day or hour. And that means, and this is the word that Paul is bringing here, to be on guard. To be prepared. If I had a title for this message today, it would be the power of preparation. There is a lot of negativity out there at the moment in among Christian circles. A lot of negativity with the state of the Western world and a lot of despair. And sometimes that despair is uh, reflected as, oh, Jesus, come soon to rescue us from the godlessness that's building up in the world. I actually have a different approach. Yeah, I pray, Lord Jesus, come. But rather, I see it not to rescue us from the negativity. Let's look at it differently. This is a great opportunity for the church of Jesus Christ to be the church that Jesus created her to be. This is a great opportunity. And the willingness and the urging, sorry, of Paul to be prepared, the more prepared we are for whenever Jesus comes, the more on our toes we'll be and the more effective we will be in reflecting the church that Jesus came to create into this world. I am unapologetically a glass half full person. I pride myself in being optimistic. I have my bad days like everyone and sometimes I get stressed and focus on the negative. But overall, I am an optimistic person. Some people may say I am an idealistic person. Well, that may be so, but I would rather be overly idealistic than underestimate what the Lord can do at any time. 
I am full of hope. Uh, the reality is the Lord will return. We don't know when, but I believe this word is telling us we should, as the people of God, be living our lives as if he could come at any second. So the question is, how do we prepare? And this is where I believe Paul has given us some insights in this final chapter. I'd like us to unpack that. Let's look afresh at what he says here with the question in mind, how do we stay in a state of preparation for the Lord? And the first thing I would suggest he says here that's important for that is, a critical part of that preparation is knowing who we are in Christ. Knowing who we are. Paul says in verse 5 here, For you are all children of light. You are children of the day. We are not of the night of darkness. And that is important to remember that. Whatever happens in your life, you are a child of God and that cannot be robbed of you. Whatever is happening in the world, whatever darkness you may be seeing or even encountering personally, it doesn't take away who you are as a child of God adopted into his family. No matter how powerless you may feel, against what's coming against you or coming against the world or coming against the country it doesn't take away from who you are I love the way Peter says this in 1st Peter 2 verse 9 he says this he says but you are a chosen people you are a royal priesthood you are a holy nation you are a people belonging to to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous night you are chosen regardless of how you feel about yourself regardless about how aware you are of your shortcomings how you might mess it up like we all do for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God but despite that God chose you to be his son or his daughter and not only that he made you a priest what that means not in the religious denominational sense but in the true sense that he has made you a priest that means you are representing him here on the earth you are a point of connection between him and others in your sphere of influence do you realize that you are a priest among your friends among your family among your neighbors among your work colleagues schoolmates wherever you are a priest if you know Jesus you are his priest that's who he's called you to be regardless of what you say or don't say nothing can take that away you are representing him he says you're a holy nation what a beautiful representation of the church that's the church as Jesus created her to be sadly the church here doesn't always live as that but that's who we're created to be a people belonging to God do you realize how incredibly valuable that makes you because value and I know I've said this before but I'm going to repeat it value ownership conveys value that's why they auction off clothes of famous people and they're worth a fortune aren't they because of who owned them well, guess what you're owned by the God of heaven and earth do you know how infinitely valuable that makes you and you and you Far more than any coat that um, Posh Spice, Victoria Becker may own or whoever else. You are infinitely valuable because you are owned by the God of heaven and earth. Know who you are. In the face of challenge, in the face of difficulty, in the face of struggle, remember you are a child of God. That is part of your pre preparation, remembering who you are. Because when we lose sight of that, we can so easily just um, meld into what's happening around us rather than stand out and think, now hang on, what's happening now doesn't have the last word. We need to remember who we are. 
remain alert. So then, says Paul in verse 6, let us not sleep as others do. Let us keep awake and be sober. But since we belong to the day, in verse 8, let us be sober. In other words, reiterating what I said before, live each day as if Jesus could come. And sober is a metaphor for not being drunk, but, but, but more than that, it's a metaphor for being steadfast, not erratic. You know, we don't need dipsy Christians who flit around back and forward and they're up one down and down the next. And, and uh, you, know, you know what I'm saying? We all have days where we go emotionally up and down. But the reality is God's word remains the same. We are still who we are. We need to remain steadfast. That means in constant connection with the Lord. So if you're having a good day, in constant connection with the Lord. If you're having a bad day, in keeping connection with the Lord. The day you feel like reading the scriptures as much as you feel like flying to the moon, that's okay. God still loves you. He's still there. The days where you miss it and you just know, I haven't been very, very godly this week at all, that's okay. Get back up next week. It's a new week. It's a new day continue push through those challenging times remain alert and it's not about fearing losing our salvation it's about staying in tune with him so that we don't miss opportunities because when we're off our game you know when i talked before about us being at that priestly role when we're alert when we see each day as an opportunity that's where we'll just there will be opportunities to share a word of encouragement Offer an act of service. You may not even be mentioning Jesus' name, but amongst your family or your colleagues, you may be fulfilling that priestly role just because you are conveying love at that particular moment. So being alert, being aware. What else? Protect your mind. Protect your mind with the absolute assurance of your salvation. This is something the enemy loves to try to rob us of. The assurance that we are saved. He says, Paul says, for a helmet, wear as your armour, a helmet, the hope of salvation. And the breastplate of faith and love, which we'll look at soon. Interesting how faith, hope and love appears again. 1 Corinthians 13, these three remain. Faith, hope and love. The greatest of these is love. But let's just look at this one. He says, for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Not hope in the sense of hoping I'm saved because we know we are, but rather knowing the future hope is ours now because we are saved. Not by works, but by grace. And he calls it the helmet of salvation, like he did in First Ephesians 6. So let's reflect on this metaphor. Okay, the helmet of salvation. When a soldier was suited up for battle, the helmet was the last piece of armour to go on. It was the final act of readiness for combat. Why? What does the helmet protect? The head... The brain, okay, and that's critical because the brain, of course, is the command centre for our body, isn't it? Hit in the head, and doesn't matter how strong we are or how uh, prepared for battle we are or in what good shape the rest of our body is, the brain's damaged and we're no longer ready for battle. So you can see how powerful this metaphor is, the helmet of salvation that the assurance that we are saved if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive our sins cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we have said yes to jesus we belong to him we don't have to worry about have we done enough that's by works it is by grace not by works thank goodness we don't have to get to the end and worry have we done enough he has given us our salvation as his loving gift on the cross. But to remember that, to be assured of that, and that's why that has to protect our mind. The enemy 
loves to mess with our head. Or is that just me? Does he mess with your head? Thoughts, challenge, condemnation, confusion, all of that? Yeah. That's why we need to put on, that means why we need to declare, regardless of what happens, I love Jesus, I have given my life to him, I am following him, I am saved, I have eternal life. Quote it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that all who believe in him shall not die and have eternal life. I believe in him, I have eternal life, so Satan get nicked. You're not going to mess with my head. So keep that though because that's a thing that prepares us for readiness when we start allowing confusion or well am i really saved and oh lord i've let you down and focusing on the negative if you've let him down say you're sorry and get back up and keep going that's all he's worried about not wallowing in the negativity so that is so important protect your mind with the assurance of salvation Protect your back and your heart with faith and love. Now, why I've said that is because Paul says, as well as the helmet of salvation, put on the breastplate of faith and love. Now, the breastplate in that armour didn't only cover the breast, the front, but also the back. There were two parts of it, the front and the back. It protected the heart the vital organs at the front and the back. That is so important to remember. You know, we have that saying, you know, someone has our back, oh, thank goodness he has my back or she has my back. What do we mean by that? They're looking after us, they're standing up, they're protecting us. The Lord has your back and he has my back. That's a given, but we have to consciously be aware of that by putting on our armour that protects our back and our heart. And Paul tells us that faith and love are that armour that protect our back and protect our heart. Love protects us. John makes it really clear in his letter, God is love. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. When we choose to love, regardless of whether we feel love, whether we feel like loving, when we choose to love, that is our armour. When we choose not to love, that is a chink in our armour. That is where the enemy can get in. When we choose to even bless those who are not blessing us, when we choose to forgive rather than harbour hurt, when we choose to love even if it's not in return, when we do that not as a feeling, as an act of a will, that is like our armour. That protects us. Love has our back, and love protects our heart. A root of bitterness defiles many, says the scriptures. Love protects our heart from bitterness and all that would rob us. And it's interesting faith, love and faith go together. You see, when we step out in faith, what does the writer of the Hebrews say faith is? The famous faith chapter, assurance of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So when we continue by faith to be obedient to the Lord, that is like an armour that protects us. When we withdraw, like for example, we've all, been times where we've stepped out in faith believing the lord's led us and it hasn't gone the way we we being the operative word we had hoped or planned now what can often happen is we withdraw okay i'm done with the stepping out in faith thing and just go back to what's known and secure the risk of that is we go with the earthly flow rather than the heavenly flow 
And that can be a chink in our armour where the enemy can get in. But when we continue, that's why I've said, I've said this many a times, I have prayed for more people to be healed that haven't got healed the way I've hoped than you could possibly imagine. But that's okay. It's never, ever, 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 ever going to stop me from praying to people for healing because the word of God says by his stripes you are healed, so we continue to pray. And I could say that I've just used healing as an example. I could use that for other places. Okay? When things go the way we don't go, get over it and move on. God's ways are higher, his thoughts are wiser. When we all get to heaven, then we'll all see why he didn't answer our prayers the way we wanted him to. But then again, when we're there, it won't matter anyway. So let's just get on with it. (laughs) Faith and love have our back and our heart. But he says, put on. We have to be conscious of that. Lord, I choose to believe nothing can rob me of the salvation you have given me. I choose, Lord, to follow you, trusting that your life is in my hands. And, Lord, I choose to love, even when everything within me wants to do the opposite. Why? Because this is a part of our preparation, our readiness. And one more. He finishes by saying, and encourage one another and build one another up how important this is you see because this is where the community of the faith is so important because in those times where it's a struggle to believe and move on in faith for those times it's a struggle to love being with other people can help encourage us being with other people in a judgment free space and i mean encourage one another doesn't mean saying where's your faith where's your love you should do this the bible says and 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 making going out making people feel even worse but rather in a judgment free space when some are languishing to be able to encourage and build one another up to be able to pray for be able to inspire on that is a critical part of the preparation and how we need that together how we really really do I've really been despairing of um, as I had social media this week uh, with what I've heard from some Christians um, in the no camp how condemning and almost vitriolic the language is towards Christians who voted yes uh, saying very judgmental things like well you know you'll st- we'll always approve and you're not saved you know you got to stand up to God and everything like that that is actually not helpful that is not helpful for the unity of Jesus Church. The same as I hear Christians at war with each other over politics or other things like that. We have to learn, I mean this is for the whole nation as a whole, I don't get me started on this, but we have to learn afresh to be able to respectfully disagree. I have friends who, Christian friends, who love God with a passion, who see differently with this. We have disagreements robust ones but they are still my brothers and sisters in Christ and I will continue to love and respect them even if I don't agree with them strongly on this or other issues why because they is Jesus church he is the head of the church at the end of the day we are all must stand on truth as we believe it which is what we've done this is what we believe is truth but with a humility to recognize that until we meet jesus face to face none of us has the full download people we go with what we believe but in the context of love and faith encouraging one another because that will speak power to the world is that Uh, making sense so that's why part of our preparation being able to encourage one another build one another up it doesn't say he doesn't say agree with one another all the time but encourage build one another up so let's go through this know who you are the power of preparation no one knows the day or the hour Jesus could come at any time be prepared know who you are 
as a child of God, as one of his priests. Remain alert, regardless of what's happening. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Protect your mind where the enemy loves to have a field day. Remember who you are. You're a child of God. You are by grace. You are saved through faith, not by anything you've done. Let faith and love have your back and your heart and encourage and build one another up so that we are ready for whatever comes. This is, I'll finish where I began, friends. The state of our world, yes, we could focus on the fact that less and less and less of our population are Christian, less and less are going to church, and we could languish in despair and, oh, Lord Jesus, come and rescue us from this mess. Or we could say, this is a wonderful opportunity for the church to shine, to rise up into God's mighty purposes and be the spirit-filled body he created to fill this earth with more of the fullness of who he is. And I'll stop there because I'm about to get launched on another sermon. That'll do us for the day. <laughs>